Hi, everyone. Welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America. This is Code Pink's weekly webinar of 20 minutes of hot news out of, the Lat out of Latin America and the Caribbean. We broadcast every Wednesday, 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific, and we focus on hot topics in the hemisphere. Um, today, uh, we are gonna be in conversation with Fulton Armstrong, who is a fellow at American University. And we're so um, fortunate to have him with us. Let me give you a, a brief, he has a lengthy resume to share with all of you, but let me give you a brief um, rundown of, of his experience. Um, so he has followed Latin American affairs for almost 30 years in a number of US government positions. He served as a senior professional staff member responsible for Latin America on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee from July 2008 to October 2011, where he also worked closely with the committee's investigations team. Prior to that, he served in the executive branch in a series of policy and analytical positions. Among other senior positions, he was national intelligence officer for Latin America the U.S. intelligence community's most senior analyst, 2000 to 2004. And for six months, he was the chief of staff of the DCI Crime and Narcotics Center. So this is specifically his background that um, we want him to share with you today. We're gonna talk, uh, start our conversation with the Department of Justice's uh, indictment of Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro on narco trafficking charges last Thursday. And, and then explore the foreign policy objectives behind that indictment and the history of this practice throughout the hemisphere, and then talk in more detail about uh, the statistics of the actual narcotics um, industry trade here um, in the Americas. So welcome, Fulton. So pleased to have you. I'm very honored that you accepted our invitation to join us today. Happy to be here. Happy to be here. This is one of many things that are going on in Latin America that, uh, that it's good that people are looking at. I mean, I can start with the indictment. The indictment was, is for me a little bit of deja vu all over again because in my salad days, I was an officer uh, serving on a task force uh, that, was, uh, that, that was formed during the crisis in Panama when the US government, in fact, ironically or not so ironically, a fellow named Elliot Abrams was profoundly involved in the Panama issue during that period of time. And we also indicted him for behavior related to narcotics, narcotics trafficking. I, 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 it's really hard to weigh the quality of evidence in the two cases, but as a policy tool, indictment is a very dangerous one because you make things radioactive without having yet had a trial. And so you, in this case of Manuel Noriega, he was indicted. We then tried a series of economic measures and diplomatic strategies, et cetera, to force him out of office. And that failed, of course, and we wound up doing an invasion in uh, December 1989 that wound up killing a significant number of, uh, of civilians, innocent civilians. And in, in this case, it's a little different, obviously. The situation uh, has developed over, over a number of years. The US government was trying very hard, going back to Bush Cheney, frankly, um, to build a case for an indictment against Chavez. In part, it's because that border between Colombia and Venezuela has traditionally been porous and traditionally bad guys move from one side to the other relatively routinely. And yes, there have been bad officials on both sides that have been uh, directly or indirectly involved or benefited from that drug trade in the area. It was very different, however, doing an indictment against a sitting head of state uh, and major commanders. And it's yet again different that you're gonna put blood money on somebody's head of a $15 million reward for, for leading to the arrest or capture of, of a sitting head of state. Now it's true, the US government continues, to, it sounds a little bit bizarre to refer to him as the former uh, yeah. regime. And uh, that's exactly a, how Barr introduced the indictment last Thursday. So yeah. we're indicting the former Venezuelan president, Nicolas Maduro. So, they, so in their minds, they're not indicting a sitting president. Is that right? 
the rationale behind that? And it's true. I mean, since January 2019, we have recognized and we used our diplomatic muscle to get 50 some odd other countries to recognize Juan Guaido as the president. But still, there's no one debating, and including in the opposition, including Guaido's own people, that that uh, that Maduro is still the head of state. He still runs the government. He still has territorial control, bureaucratic control, economic control, the central bank, etc. Um, we've basically, like a, 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 a mischievous boy pulling the wings off of a fly, we've pulled the wings and the legs off of much of the Venezuelan economy for sure and done a lot of diplomatic pressure on him for sure but he is still the sitting head of state so when you do this you it's part usually of a broader strategy i don't think that they really want to send a dea plane down there to to pick him up i think what they're trying to do uh, within their broader strategy is what they've been trying to do for a number of years now and that is to prompt someone to go in and remove this man to rid us of this priest and if they can't a popular revolt in the streets by which they haven't achieved yet i mean correct. i would argue for 20 years the us government's been trying to achieve some sort of revolt against the right. chavista movement yeah right i mean since chavez's first election in um, in 1998 there have been elements of the us government who have had that as one of their primary objectives. Even when the presidents themselves, I worked in the, you didn't mention in my bio because it is a long bio, but I was I, one of the directors. I, apologize. I was one of the directors of the National Security Council when Chavez, President elect Chavez, came to the White House. And I wasn't in the meeting itself, but I prepped President Clinton for it and the National Security Advisor, of course, and then I've got a full debrief afterward. And we decided, the president decided back then with the Secretary of State Albright's full support that we're not gonna make this guy an, our, our enemy. We don't agree with some of what he wants to do. We don't, we're a little bit nervous that he can't pull it off, etc. but let's not make this into an enemy versus enemy um, sort of thing. But there were elements of the American bureaucracy that uh, said, well, the president can say what he wants to say. I have my own agenda. And so you're er, technically you're right that for 20 years, elements of the US government have uh, have been going after him. But this indictment really kicks things up a notch. And there are some weird, I don't like conspiracy theories, but there are some weird coincidences with the timing of the indictment. It's coming just as the country is entering a crisis with the coronavirus just at a time that Maduro, taking the high road, which he doesn't often do, uh, had offered to negotiate with Guaido on finding a way for them to open a political and operational path for the delivery of assistance to the Venezuelan people during this coronavirus thing. And Guaido uh, was, was talking. He was talking. This is not the first time that the Guaido and or his emissaries were talking and it looked like there was some sort of progress that at least on limited areas, they were going to sit down and do what adults are supposed to do. And that is to negotiate solutions. And then surprise, surprise, this indictment happens. The other weird element of the story at this time uh, for which it's really difficult to find corroboratory information is this fellow named Cleaver Alcala a yes. former uh, brigadier general that's been over in Colombia associating with who knows whom was uh, by his own admission part of a 10 million dollar arms delivery that was going to go to a buddy of his on the Venezuela border for who knows what sort of activity and Cleaver Caron was uh, Alcala was um, uh, was one of the indicted officials and he handed himself over to DEA and said, here, come and take me, come and take me. It's a very friendly sort of thing. It's almost as if a reunion there of people. So who but knows? He is, correct me if I'm wrong, but he is also wanted by the Venezuelan government, correct? For, for plotting against the government in Colombia. He was cashiered two or three years ago uh, and went to Colombia. So, cashiered military guys already on somebody's list for some sort of activities. It's not surprising that 
there have been for many years, perhaps even the 20 years that you were referring to, there have been enterprising Venezuelan rebels, if you will, who have found friendships over in Colombia and uh, been part of various plans, none of which ever really is fully clarified. There was a time uh, back in, gosh, when it was 2000 and it was after the coup against Chavez, so it would have been 2003, 2004, that a group of paramilitaries, Colombian paramilitaries, had been discovered at a finca somewhere outside Caracas. It's mostly kids, 35, 40 young men uh, who had been at least doing PT, physical training. They didn't ha hadn't received their weapons yet, but they were training with these wooden carved rifle-like um, sorts of things. The Finca was owned by a prominent Cuban-American uh, who, and then the story just disappeared. Who knows? So it's not, it's not uncommon for you to have the 10, for us to sort of try to put the pieces of the puzzle together, but, but be denied the validation of the information in a way that we can really see what's going on. So this, um... When you mentioned Elliot Abrams, and of course, you know, we've seen him in various parts of Latin America, and, um, and he has a history of operations such as this in, in uh, um, forwarding U.S. economic and foreign policy objectives. One of the things that um, happened in the last few days is the repositioning of the Southern Command in the Caribbean. And I can't correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not sure if this was before or after Thursday's indictment. I will say I was at a hearing on the Hill last summer where Admiral Fowler, um, who is um, the Admiral for the Southern Command for our viewers, testified in front of Congress as far as uh, what he needed budget wise to, uh, I believe he said to retool his fleet for foreign aggression in the hemisphere. And it appears that he's moving his ships closer to the Venezuelan coast. And I wonder if you can comment on that. I, I can't really. I saw, I saw the same quotes come out of the hearing. I thought his wording was at a minimum a bit on the, the, the rare side um, because usually one doesn't use those terms. And I don't remember the exact quote myself either. But uh, it's part of his job is to have military readiness. Part of his job is also sort of semi-political. He has to work with the State Department and he lives in Miami, which is the, the nexus for a lot of the political pressures to be brought to bear uh, on issues like Venezuela. But as for the movement of ships, I don't know if ships have been moved into the area. I wouldn't be surprised, but remember that moving ships around is often much more of a gesture than it is planning. When you're really doing a plan, you don't advertise it by moving exactly, stuff around. Yeah. And if so, it's the, posturing, so to speak. I think it's show, perhaps yeah. if in true, if indeed something is going on. But also, coronavirus changes the game quite significantly. Yes. Okay. You're right. not going to put you're not going to put American troops on the ground in the middle of what's for the U.S a health crisis and where you could be going into a hornet's nest, a biological hornet's nest in some of the barrios and ranchos in Venezuela. So I doubt it. If one were to really get weirdly conspiratorial stuff, what you see in some of the rhetoric, especially the rhetoric coming out of the State Department, even though people at the State Department claim that they want to promote peace processes and stuff, they want to promote uh, Elliot Abrams rolled out his grand plan, which really isn't much of a plan yesterday. It's basically going back to square one and say the immediate this and the immediate that, and that right. we're going to support in his talkers. He, he revealed that our candidate will, be, will, will not become interim president, but our candidate, Juan Guaido, will be our preferred candidate in the, in the new, newly scheduled elections. Uh, and all that, that part of the rhetoric has been has laid the groundwork, and some of this has gone for some sort of weird little military type of thing. But I'm, this really puts us in the conspiratorial column right. here, yeah. for which evidence is very shady. But they are talking about the hemispheric threat 
when you talk about threats and you talk about hemispheres, you're basically laying the groundwork and you say this regime must end and right. language like that. And we had these funny things that came out of the Pence office, but it came also out of the State Department referring to the PDVSA employees that have been under house arrest pending investigations as hostages. But when you do that and you're, you're, you have these goofy scenarios of arms moving around and you have these areas where you're trying to provoke, remember the, the so-called humanitarian aid distribution efforts at the Santander Bridge over on the Colombian border in Cuquetá, Cuquetá last year. You have these, you know, military aircraft showing up. For our viewers, oh. this was February 23rd of 2019. Right. When you have these straws in the wind, you have to be very careful analytically not to have the straws come together. They might be straws that the regime, as they like to go, or the former regime, is supposed right. to see yeah. and supposed to be shaking in its boots, but but it had, for, for which it doesn't work. When you do these sorts of things, especially when you indict members of the military high command, you actually increase their loyalty, even if you've seen signs that the military itself is very, very anxious about what's going on in a country. When you indict them and you basically make them a group, they're going to hang as a group, um, frankly. But it's not totally wacky for those straws in the wind, which might be signals to be construed by people as some form of pre-staging of American uh, aggression, of US aggression. I don't think it works though, frankly, on the ground because the Venezuelans people, they're very hungry, they're very scared. They're also suffering from exhaustion and fear uh, and all of that. I'm not sure that the message that we wanna be giving them at this point is that we're turning up the pressure cooker in hopes that they explode and that somehow the mess is going to lead to a pro-US, pro, uh, pro our values sort of government. I, I would um, add to that, that I think my personal experience there in Venezuela and um, over the years is that putting this pressure for regime change on um, the people has is uniting the more moderate people into um, a, I would say, more moderate opposition in dialogue with the Chavista government to preserve national sovereignty. There's a great sense of nationalism developing in response to these regime change efforts and um, also in response to unifying to battle this. Uh, you know, the um, COVID-19, the coronavirus. Right. And that think, was, yes. I think you're right that, that um, although Venezuelan nationalism uh, has been formed in funny little ways because it's a rentier economy. It's, yes. a, it's, a, it's economy that is, has de been as dependent on its markets as anything that's homegrown. And when you have a rentier economy, all economic things become perverted and political things become perverted around that one commodity. And that's how you could have Punto Fijismo, where Tweedledee and Tweedledum share power. They alternate power uh, uh, among them. And you have then the neglect of the quality of your political institutions. It's also in some cases where the national definition was formed against the U.S., uh, for yes. example, there are, there, are, there are serious Cuba scholars who would say that Cuban nationalism, if you take out the anti-US uh, part of it, it's, a, it's sometimes hard for Cubans to articulate it, even though they have, a, they have a really rich sense of nationhood and cultural identity and all of that. Venezuela doesn't have as rich a set of uh, other nationalist attributes as, for example, uh, Cuba would have or Mexico would have. It's more like Central America, where it, it has really not done that national identity thing in the healthiest possible way. But you're right that what we're doing is by isolating people in the government, we have people unify around them, and we make opposition-minded people more and more nervous. And then they go toward either towards supporting the government or they became rigidly neutral. 
And then you have the split of the opposition that Juan Guaido and Leopoldo Lopez, his true mentor, the real power yes, behind, exactly. yeah. behind Juan Guaido is Leopoldo Lopez, who's been living in the Spanish embassy since the failed coup of April 30, uh, 2019. There are many failed coups, so we have to actually give the date um, of that yes. one. And Leopoldo uh, and all that, that a lot of people don't really want to support them. And there are good thinking moderates within the opposition, but whose good voices get lost in the mix. Uh, well, or they get um, subterfuge by U.S. dialogue and potential intervention. When you see more moderates wanting to dialogue with the current government and wanting to find an internal solution among themselves, that always seems, at least from the U.S. narrative, to be subterfuged from Washington. Any right. attempt to solve the issue other than what the U.S. wants. The yes. United States, our foreign policy, our, and our most noble moments in our foreign policy are when we remain committed to process. We can have a preferred outcome, <laughs> but, our, but our commitment should be to process when we let elections move their own way, when we let negotiations move their own way, and we let historical forces work themselves out and let the compromise be that way, rather than our commitment being to a preordained conclusion. When we have a preordained conclusion, we wind up neglecting processes and then splitting the decent forces that, are, that should be driving those processes and weakening them. So I agree with you on that. You know, listening to you talk about allowing the process to, you know, run its course, there's something that we're working here um, within Code Pink on our Latin America team is as far as identifying and, and um, defining our overarching theme. And we are all, um, the three of us, Michelle, your good friend as well, we are all opposed to the strict reinforcement of the Monroe Doctrine. And I believe it was during the Roosevelt administration where the president uh, said, we're not going to dominate the hemisphere. We're going to practice a good neighbor policy. Am I correct in understanding that? And to me, that sounds like what you're saying is let, let the process run its course, you know, and, and see, and then manage perhaps in a, in a more diplomatic manner, the outcome. Right. And accept it, accept and the legitimacy. Accept it. That's the key the word. Yes. I mean, there's yes. an evolution. Each one of our presidents, whether it goes back to Roosevelt or JFK in the 60s, where he tried his initiatives in Latin America. And certainly uh, I watched very closely the Bill Clinton era, where we actually began apologizing for atrocious behaviors of the past that we had been involved in, in Guatemala and Chile, uh, et, et cetera, and other places. We, it's been evolutionary. And of course, Barack Obama at his first summit of the Americas in 2009 said, I refuse to call it our backyard. This is our neighborhood. These are not our, 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 our little boys and girls. These are our partners. And he tried to really build a partnership um, with them. It's evolutionary because no one's, no one has really had this happen. The bizarre thing, though, is that even though that has been the historic trend over so many years, that the Trump administration first, uh, first in his first Secretary of State and now with Pompeo, uh, have proudly said that the Monroe Doctrine is alive and well. Yeah, John uh, Bolton in Miami last year. <laughs> and John Bolton yeah. did it. And stuff. So yeah. it's a little bit weird that, you know, what do they think their real constituency is? And if they think this is all about Florida, they might look over their shoulder that there are now about 150 to 200,000 angry Puerto Ricans to whom throwing right. paper towels after the hurricane was, was not a, a gesture of friendship, but was an insult. And to our own citizens. To our own citizens. To our right. own citizens. Yeah. So I know you you mentioned that you you had a maximum of 30 minutes and yeah. we're at 1230 right now. Are you able to give us just a two minute summary of the actual narco trafficking trade coming out of Latin America, what the principal roots are? Mm -hmm. um, all of us, I think all of us viewing and, and watching you today, we all know the United States is the largest market right. in the world. 
Um, and we never talk about addressing that as part of the solution. So can you give us a quick, before we let you go? Yeah, we, uh, it's funny how we apply certain analytical principles on issues in some cases, but we don't in others. This is, we usually use market, market economic Print, uh, models to understand things. And in this case, though, we don't want to. We are the market. Every nickel, every nickel that all of the violent people between the producers, the actual coca growers and the consumers, every, every nickel that they're fighting over, every drop of blood that they're shedding, including many, many innocent people in Mexico and Central America, uh, we're the ones that are funding all of those various activities. So if we establish that. When, when I was in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, you mentioned that I was on the investigations team. Uh, we once did a little bit of an investigation. It's very hard to do this investigation because it mixes the foreign policy with the domestic policy. But we would get these briefings from the State Department INL, from ONDCP in the White House and, and from the DEA that had these maps of Latin America that had uh, various arrows of different colors and the arrows were very thick to show how much stuff was coming up, creeping up to our border. And every one of the arrows, some would go to the Caribbean, some would go to the Caribbean and then into Mexico, some would come up the Pacific, etc. Uh, and, and every one of those arrows stopped at the US border because the war on drugs has never really been fought the same way in the US as it's been fought. We haven't done it with blood and weapons in the United States, the way we've asked the transit countries um, to do it, including the Central Americans, all of whom have gotten corrupted in the process, and Mexico, all of whom got corrupted. So there are huge costs on this. The fact is that the flow is now more complex than before. Before we had cocaine and we had opium, uh, op we had heroin and we had um, marijuana that usually could come flowing through these various rivers up into the United States. It's changed now, of course, with methamphetamines, with fentanyl and, and things that can be made in labs, often right, in, right somewhere in Mexico. So that, that the trade has changed, but the fundamental truths of what we're talking about, particularly when you're going to be indicting sitting heads of state, is that the flow of the, of the, the volume of coca, coca base or coca paste and cocaine that flow has remained largely the same despite our investments in at least $10 billion in Plan Colombia. And then if you look at the Mexican part, Merida, which projected somewhat down into Central America, another billion or two, who knows how much, that the flow has been the same. So the same maps that we had back in the 1980s probably would show the flow now. Some of this stuff, would go, yes, some of the stuff does go through uh, Venezuelan border areas, but most of it does not. Most of it does not. And as I the said- The vast majority of it does the not. The vast majority that, of it yeah. do not. Um, and, those, so, and those countries such as Honduras, the United States is still backing the sitting president whose brother was, was prosecuted successfully last fall for narco trafficking. Yeah. I'm not a prosecutor, and I was an intelligence analyst, not a, a, a legal case builder. But I would think that the, the legal case builders, the ones who were funneling information to prosecutors, could put together a lot stronger set of arguments about Juan Orlando involvement than, than you can Maduro's personal involvement. Now, could Maduro, Maduro like any president, his predecessors, even before Chavez, yes. could they be held responsible for for things that happen in the border area, particularly corruption involving local officials? I think technically, morally, you could hold them that, but that's not indictable sorts of behavior. But most of the drugs have never come through Venezuela. This so-called cartel de soles that is being used, being trumpeted in the in the indictment documents. No, uh, no serious analyst that I know of outside of government. I don't know what they're saying inside of government right now, uh, but no serious observer um, today would say that it's a, that there is such a cartel. It's a vehicle of convenient way of pegging a name on something that's almost impossible to verify, and therefore you can get away with saying in public. 
So it's very, it's very nerve rattle. It's very nerve wracking that we have these very precious analytical tools, intelligence tools, analytical tools, prosecutory tools. We have grand juries. We have all of these mechanisms that are supposed to be above politics, but seem to basically be used to make a political point as a broader policy of one particular administration. Well, well with that, I will let you go. You've given us um, 36 minutes of just yeah. fascinating information and a terrific conversation. And I'm so pleased and honored to have met you. And okay. I hope that we can come, that you can come back and we can further explore um, different um, issues related to US foreign policy in the hemisphere as a whole, Latin America and the Caribbean specifically. And um, I look forward to to another conversation with you. Okay, my pleasure. Okay, thank Take you care. so much. Thank okay. you, Fulton. Bye bye, my pleasure. And so I will just let um, the re you viewers just know I posted a few things in our in our chat. There's an action um, posted at codepink.org. It's actually codepink.org slash Venezuela underscore charges. It's a sign on letter that we would encourage you to participate uh, to add your name to um, to retract the indictment against Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro and to attract and to retract the indictment based on on much of what you heard um, this afternoon regarding uh, the manipulation of US foreign policy tools to affect regime change in a country. And we've seen this multiple times throughout the American Americas with the United States. And also please join us next week, Wednesday, 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific on what the F is going on in Latin America. And one other thing that you can do, uh, educational tool that I would encourage you to do is to listen to Code Pink Radio every Thursday, 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. 8 a.m. Pacific on WBAI out of New York City and WPFW um, out of Washington, D.C. That's a live show, 11 a.m. Eastern and 8 a.m. Pacific. Okay, everybody, thank you so much uh, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you for your patience with some of my technical um, glitches on the at the 12 o'clock hour. And we look forward to you joining us again next week. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. <laughs>